continues. Come on, let me hear it catch up. I'm sorry, we were, we were talking last about Bill Simpkins' set that he's playing tonight. We, that's the last topic. Other topics were music, as you might expect. Well, actually, I have a question for you about music. About music. The kinds of things that people play? Yes. Uh, um, you were talking about uh, how you were into classical music for a while and how yeah. when you listen to different pieces you have to give yourself these are your words give yourself in a different way oh, I, I'm going to look for the question Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to know what you meant by uh, give yourself in a different way when listening to music? I haven't got the faintest idea. <laughs> give yourself, what, do you, what did you see in give yourself that could lend clarity to that? Well, it sounded like, it sounded like you were talking about uh, the best way to experience the music or to um, allow oneself to absorb the music. And you used the, the um, words. The, Thank you. The, the words like um, I, I have no idea. Uh, I'm I'm interested in yeah, listening okay. to music. Yeah. So uh, I want to know how to give myself. When I was growing up, uh, my sister was a singer. And she used to play in local bands, and then finally got into uh, the band at One Fifth Avenue, which is the nice bar band, very nice place, and it was a real nice unit. But anyhow. Uh, I was with a group of, uh, of friends who uh, were into music, and, and uh, that's the days, you know, like you could, for 15 cents, you could get a double-decker bus and go from 59th Street up to 136th Street along the Hudson River. Mm. Right with your, to the, your friends on to the Apollo, yeah, and then go into Lucian Stadium and hear the New York Philharmonic or one of the big Philharmonics for sixty cents. Uh, cool. When you can still get around town, and you could have a lot of fun on the bus, and and uh, and so in some way I, I enjoyed it. But after the war, uh, I met nothing but uh, chaos. No, I mean, hmm. uh, the people I knew uh, I mean, they had no interest other than uh, Marxism was kind of running. Hmm. Communism was a, a kind of the intellectual life, uh, and they used to have Friday nights where the, they would play classical music and then have talks. Mm. But I got involved in the group because I liked the music. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was it was the only. It was the only thing that I experienced that had any meaning. Mm. It was the classical music. Like I am not into music. A lot of people are into music. I'm not, I'm not into music. Uh, I'm into pieces, certain pieces. I know what you mean. And uh, some people are into music and they like the full range of musician, musical works, etc. But uh, pieces. 
Wait. But I, I don't know how to answer your question. When you say you're into pieces, do you mean hey, like hey. the message that the... Like it was the only thing. It was the, the, the... Like, how could there be so much meaning and beauty in music and chaos everywhere I saw and coming out of World War II, let me assure you, the idea of chaos and absurdity was right in my face for a couple of years. Pierre, when you were paying fifteen cents know. for the when you were paying fifteen cents for the bus ride, was there a like a minimum wage at that time? Because I was trying to get a comparative scale of how much fifteen cents would be. Or the, the time frame? No, the like in, in today's currency, how much would fifteen cents or sixty cents be? Today. Today. No, there's no comparison. Yeah, I know. well, because I because. You know, t to go to a symphony today, you have to have a pocket full of money. Yeah. About 160. Right? I mean, yeah. there's... To get like, nice we'd, we'd, uh, we'd go to the opera at uh, New York Ballet and... Uh, or Carnegie Hall. Carnegie Hall was expensive. It's a dollar twenty. <laughs> No, we don't realize that in the days I grew up, people with money always sought ways to support the arts. Mm -hmm. And that's simply not true in today's world. The richer want to stay rich and get richer. Yeah. And so, like, uh, you know, there was a Gunenheim Museum of Art, you know, every, the, the witch could have their name on everything, and uh, the prices were the hell they were down. I mean, uh, you, there's no comparison between the way the rich use money and the way they used it in those days. Wow. You were asking something about well, Many of the art schools were supported. <clears throat> the different world. <clears throat> so I came in late, but you caught my ear on one thing when you said you came from the chaos and the absurdity right in your face. Yeah. And you listen to music. And the order and the beauty and the meaning that was in this music was in It was the only place I could find it. What's the it? Pardon me for being late, but ordering. Oh, okay. Wasn't that? And then did that lead you further to other questions? Because I mean, obviously, I, my my dad went to Vietnam, and I've heard the story of before he went, he was an easygoing surfer boy, and then he comes home and he's like a total killer, and the rest of his life is trying to like deal with that. You, on the other hand, <laughs> definitely took a different route. And uh, sounds like the order of view you, you found in music, like, kicked you in a certain direction, yeah. or, um, or attracted you. I landed into uh, '46. Uh, this strange kind of philosophy, and. Uh, yeah, there's no one to talk to about philosophy. Like, I make the joke, but it's true. When I got my first book on Eastern thought, I went down to a local bookstore next to a famous theater, a little one, and uh, I showed him the book. And like, the bookstore was adjacent to this movie house, which was extraordinary because they would feature a hundred films in the summer, every day a different film. And they were all pre-World War II films, European, Russian, French, Italians, etc. 
And so uh, I was very interested in understanding what the hell was going on in Europe before World War II. And, you know, that, that was a way to discover it. Mm. But next door is this bookstore see, that carries a lot of similar literature. With an interesting clientele. Yeah. So I went to the book dealer who I knew, and he said, oh, we wouldn't carry books like this. I said, well, where the hell do you find them? He said, there's only one bookstore I know of. He's a book dealer on 57th Street. No, I'm on 96th on the west side, and that's way on the east side. And I said, what's the name of it? He said, uh, I, forget, I forget the name of it. Um, ah, anyhow. Uh, so I went there. And I walk in, and, and the, like every shelf, Oriental literature. Wow. Expensive issues. See, a lot of series done by d d universities, and but within which there were some, you know, there were some important pieces, and I found. Uh, Perennial philosophy and Uspensky, and those two I rode for many years, but I couldn't turn, you know, I couldn't go to one of my friends and say, "Hey, how about this?" I mean, no one gave a damn about this stuff. I mean, it was a taboo in a way. I mean, <clears throat> taboo like what? Like to think that way, to think in an Eastern way was just. So the uh, it's a vacuum. This is pre-acid, then. <laughs> is that it's like the American Academy of Asian Studies, the graduate school I went to? The the total student body interested in comparative philosophy East and West. Uh, it wasn't more than 30 people. Wow. Like I studied with this Lama Tata. There was only four, but only three regular students went to his class. Wow. <laughs> he was the guy that was given the, the, the Tibetan Tripitaka by the Dalai Lama. And it didn't make any difference to those until acid hit. That what woke those, up. That woke up San Francisco. What were those students like? Pardon me. I mean, since there was such a vacuum, like it sounds to me like you were on a quest to find meaning and order, especially given yeah. the chaos and the absurdity that you yeah. saw. That was your direction that you went and that attracted you. What were these other students like? Were they there like scholars or were they interested in the states of mind or were they philosophers or were they students, I guess is what I'm asking like. Well, you have to remember now, uh, uh, Joe Campbell's first book came out, see, in, in the beginning of the 50s. That was a breakthrough. Someone began looking at mythology. No one did. Fraser and uh, uh, the White Goddess, was, mm -hmm. which was a great. very important oh, book, great. but very very few people ever got into it. You know, I'd get into it, but. So it's a different kind of world. Hmm. It still is different, by the way. The way that we practice philosophy and the, the, the ideas that we get into, the technical nature of reading the book, the states of mind we talk about, the mingling of this sort of academic intellectual with actual experience. I come across lots of spiritual people and they still, they're still like, there's eight of us here, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, or what, what, 
Then Seven Paul Brunton's series, I went through that. But yeah. I mean, and, uh, hmm. uh, most people's see our culture was dominated, and to some degree, is still dominated by psychology. But by second, we're talking about behaviorism and Freud. Those two things were were the mode of the language of discussion that you, know, you presupposed it when you were working in some kind of intellectual circle. That, and Marx or communism, that's, that was it. But you talked about a chaos before the war. Can you compare before the war and after the well, war, the, 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 the state of intellectual and, and you know, the, the state of society such that there would be this, quote, chaos and has it changed any? Well, you know... Uh, Before and after the war. She, um, my own personal world before World War II uh, was in shambles. Uh, like, I grew up in, in the Depression, where people who worked at the gasoline station, you know, pumping gas and cleaning windows, had to have a BS degree. Wow. And jobs were extremely rare until World War II started, and suddenly America got to work. Okay. But. Uh, Like my family, my mother used to tell us stories when she was in Java and Sumatra, living in a house with 32 servants. Not bad. No, you right. had a servant to call the servant. Yeah. <laughs> and my father <clears throat> was one of the, historically, one of the great greatest con people. He's a educated trumper. Okay. And uh, he did all kinds of fantastic scams, including prohibition. I love that one. Yeah, those, right. He's a mastermind for pulling off great stunts, you see. But then he started a it firm. Really was a he great started stunt. a firm in California. He got someone's liquid sugar formula and saw a way to improve upon it and knew he could make a fortune in Southern California canning industry. So he started a firm and the two, two partners ripped him off. <laughs> and he had escaped California and he got caught in New York City and uh, conned the police for about a year or so, making believe that he had insights into the mafia and who he knew, and, <laughs> and he was their secret agent and all that kind of crap. It was, you know, crazy. But then they sent him to jail for 10 years. So he was in jail from, for 10, like from my year, six to 16. Wow. So my mother suddenly had to wake up with three kids in the middle of depression and walk down the street without a penny in her pocket. So she went through something. Some women go through something. I don't know whether you know that. I do, yeah. Do, uh, do they? Yeah, they oh, do. Oh, yeah. she was one of them. And. Uh, So, uh, going to school was was a, a problem. Yeah. Uh, that whole period, you see. Uh, I grew up at a time when the, the great strikes in the garment industry were going on. Well, my mother was a piece worker. She learned sewing and knitting all that from her own past. 
So she did part-time work with furs, and Pierre uh, would put a overcoat on, and I'd wear all of the furs that she had done strapped around me, and I'd try to walk through the picket lines, you know. They wouldn't have been pleasant no. if they caught me carrying contraband, as it were. Scab labor. You know, yeah. and... Uh, You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a chaos. That whole period's a chaos. And, uh, and I'm the one that found the tennis courts. My mother used to play tennis in the old days. And you could play tennis in a New York City public parks. You had to pay $3 a year. <laughs> you know, and we're talking about the Depression, you know? Yeah. And so that became an avenue for my family to get, get off the streets to some degree, which was getting pretty dangerous. And uh, so simultaneously, my sister and mother became like stars in the public arena of tennis and sports. And my mother's very sweet and kind and wonderful. Uh, it turned out one of the great tournaments I witnessed was my mother and my sister finals in a tennis match. Against each other? Yeah, <laughs> opposing one another. My sister won. My mother refused to put a, a her plate out for dinner for about six to uh, eight uh, weeks. Uh, uh, uh. Wow. But your mother was the guy who shot the... <laughs> I mean, somehow that has something to do about your perception of victory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure what. Do, do you think that yeah, might, have, might have made or, an impression? Were you younger? Huh? Were you younger than your sister? No, they were older. Yeah, so... So I was watching. Yeah, you <laughs> But isn't your mother the guy who shot the pirate in the Malay pirate, is it? Remember, you know, didn't your mother shoot that guy in the... Oh, that's a, a So she's not a mother. gentle person. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. Or she's very... She had many stories. Many That one was a talents. good one. <laughs> yeah, she's on a junk and it's raided by pirates. And she liked to tell the story of how good her aim was as she picked up a guy's cock that was shot, she shot off him oh, on the deck of the ship. And, yeah. and they would like to go into the jungles in Java and Sumatra and canoeing and shooting the various animals. But I enjoy telling the story that, you know, sometimes the weeds would get caught up in the small little propeller driven canoe and they just push the natives overboard to clean it up and they did it very fast oh, they used I to they say did. you know you really make them work well you know because as the crocodiles come down they have you know they, they work real I, I used to admire that <laughs> people were expendable in that yeah. world <laughs> they're, they're colonials they're from the colonials which is very almost parallel to the attitude of the intelligentsia in New York to Asian literature, right? Asian philosophy. It's almost parallel, right? Yeah. They were Europeans. They had psychology. They had Freud. They had behaviorism. These Asian philosophers. Huh. Don't you think? Uh, well. Hard to say, huh? Or what was what paradigm was functioning such that they cut it off like that? You, you know, I, I went to this place called Squim, Washington. Which is? Squim, S-E-Q-U-I-M. It's an Indian name. No. Oh. And they are the second largest lavender producing city, area, in the world. Second oh. only to France, right? To Provence, I think. But the thing is, 
that town, everybody in it looks like they work for Disney at Disneyland. And their bookstores have only two sections, romance and Christian literature. You cannot find, they have two bookstores. I went into both looking for a copy of Rouse for some reason. I had some books, not others. They didn't have any philosophy. No philosophy. And even in Gold Beach, Oregon, they built a huge, big, two-story, three-story bookstore, and they didn't have, they had only a very few, like maybe 20 philosophy books, most of which were old books, put in their secret old bookcase, you know, expensive. Sick culture up there. Hmm. So. Jowett translations of the Republic. No, they didn't even have Jowett. <laughs> that's like what we get around here. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that's, but that, well, in Squim, well, Washington, well. it's like they're, mm. what? It's like uh, Trumpers everywhere, or whatever you call that mentality where they have no need to go beyond fantasy and fantasy. <laughs> fantasy and myth? Fantasy and. I, I don't know. So, but I had a record. Yeah. In high school, I had the record of having the the greatest record of truancy of anyone. Hmm. Truancy? Well, that that that's a tough one to. I've met a few of those students. You know, I mean, you, me, you have to have a mark of distinction. <laughs> Was that when you were selling newspapers to help your family? Well. Or was it just that it was, what was, what led to the truancy, Pierre? Well, none of, nothing that I had been exposed to in school made it, God, made any difference to me. It was all, it was all meaningless, it was just, uh, Some don't so change. I'd cut out and I, uh, like I enjoyed going down to the, uh, often, Metropolitan Museum of Art, they had room 32 which had all the Rembrandts. Hmm. And I'd watch these guys that would put up their easel and copy. Hmm. And I was interested in how the hell they copy, how they copy that, you know? Huh. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the Metropolitan. That's no. funny. <laughs> they, they don't do that anymore, so that was. No, they won't allow them. That's a special era. Yeah, they, oh, they, they see, that's another thing. They don't allow that now. You can't participate in the art. But you could, you could watch these artists coming in and putting up their easel and copying the masters, you know. And I was, I always, I always enjoyed the difference, you know. I was, you know. Mm. Could you see why the master was a master? Pardon me. Could you see why the masterpiece was a masterpiece? Yeah. And how the copy, in one sense, was different. Yeah, and uh, so there are a lot of things to, to see in New York. So, I, oh yeah. So they called me in when I was sixteen, and they said, "Pierre, goodbye. You're out of the school. We can now kick you out." Hmm. And I said, "Well, I haven't been in too long, anyhow." <laughs> <laughs> Today, if you had done that and then tried to go back to school. They would make you go through a certain amount of hoops to get into a college. When yeah, you went well, back a, to academia or whatever yeah. version you went to, how'd you get back in? But he had the GI Bill. Huh? Also, he sent him a letter describing why he wanted to be in. I think, as far as St. John's, didn't you send a letter of application to St. John's that said why? Yeah. And they read that letter. And oh, okay. I sent a letter to the college president. I said, if you like any other school, forget this letter because I'm interested. He said, come on, spend three days with us. All we read is 100 great books. I said, that's all you do, just read 100 great books? <laughs> no bullshit? Why? I'll go down. My God, I was really quite interested. For the first year. <laughs> well, the, the question of chaos, Gina just muttered something under her breath that really caught my, my attention. Yeah, well, and I had an interest in uh, 
trying to figure out how the Western, so-called Western universe, you know, Western civilization or culture could produce all the fascists, all the dictators, all the terrible social disasters of chronic ups and downs in the economy, you know, the, like what the hell is wrong, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, I looked at, uh, in a way it was natural, natural to look at these books with suspicion. So, How, run that by me again. It was natural to look at the books with suspicion because, hmm. why was it natural to look at those books with suspicion? I missed that connection. Well, the, the hundred books, those are the ones? What did you say? Yeah, those are, yeah. Was that, did you go into the yes, philosophy class on that, the... The hundred great books, before they became part of that multi-volume, right? Yeah. We had to get them in separate, separate purchases, you see. And then, uh, later, University of Chicago put out the entire series, but that was after I left St. John's. And they used all the out, all of the outdated, con you know, translations. Public domain. <laughs> yeah, so they didn't want to pay anybody anything. So it's. A, you said you, so the you, first year was interesting. Did Second you year uh, was partially because we got into Plotinus. Ah. And? Well, he was, you know, it, was, it made sense. But uh. Uh, like getting into St. Augustine, uh, you know, like a, and the fact that what really converted St. Augustine was Plotinus, not the Bible. Mm. Right? He read Plotinus and woke up, and his friends persuaded him to get, get in the Catholic Church. And he had a real problem, because he, he, uh, uh, his wife or girlfriend, he didn't want to leave, but he had to get in the Catholic Church. And he mentioned that she was three years younger than the legal uh, age limit for women to get married in Rome. I've always wondered what was the legal age limit, but he got her when she was three years younger. Does that suggest maybe she may have been around 10? Yeah. Yeah, or nine, or, yeah. you know, <laughs> nine to 12. <laughs> Juliet, in Romeo and Juliet, was only 12 years old. Pardon me? In Romeo and Juliet, huh. her age is only 12. Therefore, he's three years younger than yeah. the legal age. Yeah. must have been a nine. Yeah. Which uh, is a, a, old enough for, you know, to get married, you know, young. Oh, uh, barf. No? Or you think? <laughs> oh, barf. Uh, do you happen to know any? Girls under nine? My daughter is almost eleven. Well, she she's yeah. old. Oh, barf! <laughs> Miss the train. That just shows you the role of women for thousands of years, like, and the subjugation of their mind. So, like, ugh, barf. Hmm. Good thing he chose God, huh? <laughs> so. Well, hmm. what, what, Pierre? Uh, what would you say? What would you say was your biggest um, takeaway from the war? Like what? Uh, on the, on the other side, how did it benefit you? Well, you know, given my background, what do you think it was like? Uh, 
my unit was six men, and uh, I went through, through the war, by the way, they never gave me sergeant stripes, but they assigned me to be in charge of these six guys, which is a, an absurdity beyond absurdities. Anyhow, we had a jeep, we had a 30 heavy on the side, and we mounted with a 50 on top, and we took the mufflers off the jeep, and we were this in uh, <laughs> southern France as a breakthrough, and we're the first, we're the, the <laughs> A hot rod jeep with a 50 millimeter cannon on it. Right, I'm um, ready. Jesus Christ. Right. Nice. What do you think wow, it's like? What do you road. think it's like to get to a mall, uh, you know, you're going up a hill, and you're watchful as hell, you turn around, and you see an army behind you, everyone moving. Wow. And you're number one. It's a rather interesting state of mind, you know? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. having suffered all kinds of defeats my whole life, and suddenly, <laughs> number one. I, I hate to bring this up, but I have this feeling that you were one of the few people who met Kilroy. Mm. I have this bad feeling. Well, I, I had two. I had a, a haunting image uh, that lasted many years. Uh, south of Naples is Paston, and they have a temple there by the shore. Beautiful. And uh, that that seeing that. It had a great impression upon me for for through the whole war. I don't know why, but uh, you'd been there before. Yeah, yeah, must have been or something. But uh, what kind of a temple? It's those great uh, Doric, uh, the great oh. Doric uh, temples of Poseidon and Athena. Yeah, Poseidon. Yeah. Wow. Right by the shore of it. And they were buried in mud, so they survived. Yeah. And then, you know, when I got uh, in Angio, <coughs> uh, uh, I, I did some interesting things, I got a medal for it, but suddenly then, when the unit is pulled back and you get replacements and resupplies, they have a big parade. And this was the first major parade since Salerno. And like 15,000 men have to march by and uh, salute the guys that are getting medals. And there I am, the great failure. Mm. <laughs> and 15,000 guys go by, you have to salute you, right? Yeah. That, was a, that was a high. That could have been a high. That was a kind of pleasant. Rock star. Rock, Pleasant. Rock star. I have a question. Yeah. How long? Nice job. Nice job. Yeah, that was you know kind of. How long? How long were you in when they walked by? Like in terms of times of. How long was I in? Before they, this scene took place, were you in a longer time than these people that were walking by? And the reason. Well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, were they new troops or? Uh, You saw a lot of... Three months, maybe. The reason I asked that was because in interviewing these vets, one of them mentioned that he, was, he wasn't in very long, but what he learned was that what you learn in boot camp is not what goes on in the ground. And those people that are seniors become seniors, whether, whatever rank they are because they've got all the knowledge of what it's like to be there. So I, that's what I was asking, whether they saw you as their leader because 
you had the experience. Yeah, but they may have, but they sure as hell didn't like the fact that someone with the same rank as they are putting them in a variety of situations which they may have liked to be otherwise. Oh, okay. Well, that's different. So I'm for the accolades. And well, the that's because one. I was really a, a bloody nuisance in the service. You oh, know, like that's different. When we got pulled back for a variety of re replacements and stuff, you know. And, uh, uh, a lot of guys did a lot of things, and I didn't do those things. <laughs> uh, I remember the wrong the wrong rifle story, wasn't it? That there was some kind of a <laughs> you you used to talk about you, you know you had to be there was going to be an inspection by an officer at some e right event and so they chose this guy went past you came back and asked you to show your rifle to him, right? Oh Only yeah. Only it wasn't your rifle. Yeah. That's pretty funny. That was another medal I got and. Uh, General stopped, he's parading, and he stops by me. I'm getting out of the middle. He says, right, and he looks and he says, Oh, you've been uh, here and there? And yeah, he said, uh, uh, He stops, he's ready to walk away, and he turns back and he says, Sir, uh, uh, Private, uh, what's the number on your rifle? I said, uh, Oh, shit. Uh, General, uh, I never use this fucking thing. I happen to use a machine, submachine gun, and I just picked this up in order to get it through this parade. <laughs> Top sergeant is going along with him and going, "I'm going to kill this guy later." <laughs> Do you guys want some more coffee? When, when, Pierre, I, I Pierre? don't. Yeah. I don't want to push you, Pierre. I don't want to push you in any direction you don't want to go, but when you said a lot of guys did things you didn't do, it, they did a lot of stupid things that would put them at risk that you didn't do, or that you did things that were entirely unique from what they did? Well, uh, uh, you know, a lot of guys go out and get drunk, yeah. right, and smash and do a variety of things, and uh, uh, I was pretty much a solo. Okay. Uh, thank you. But, uh, okay. Well, I, you know, I, I got in trouble several times, really major trouble, but, but, uh, uh, it turned out that it was to, to the advantage. I was right in making decisions. Uh, like uh, when you're up on the front at uh, Casino, you're on a hill. You're, all, you're, you're fighting f to get a hill, essentially. You don't it's a, be on it's a hill on top of a hill. Yeah. Casino's a town, mm -hmm. and then there's the Monte Casino yeah. on top of it. Yeah. We were on the, we were on the hill next to the Monte Casino. Okay, yeah, I know what that is. And uh, see, the big problem is when you're relieved and another unit comes in. That's very dangerous because of a variety of reasons, you know, noise and etc. So uh, they gave me the job. See, for every several hundred yards, they'd put men who could then take the, re the withdrawing troops to the next point and the next point until they finally got back to the rear. Rear means up to the artillery. And uh, uh, I had led several patrols before this, so I knew the area. So I bypassed several of these people who should have been taking them from this, from point B to C or D to E, and I just went from A to E, and uh, that was breaking all kinds of rules. But it turned out that 
we had a number of people that made sufficient noise to reveal to the Germans that we, the, my unit was being pulled back, and they pounded the hell out of the lechery, which is right next to Casino, thinking that that would be the time the troops would go through it. They, they zeroed in, and I had taken them around, <laughs> around it. <laughs> so <laughs> a captain, well, my, my captain came up and said, you know, you'd be court-martialed uh, up to this point, but you're goddamn lucky that you did what you did, thanks. <laughs> So I had the habit of making my own decisions, and uh, had you seen the possible? It tended to be worked out, but you know. Uh, um, had you seen the possibility? Pardon me. Had you seen that it was a better route? Oh yeah, I knew it. Uh, yeah, I, I just I didn't even think twice about it. I figured, I'm not going to go down that way. It's going to go through Valletta. I'm not going to go there. I just bypass it. What I liked was remember you, you. There's two really interesting. I don't know if you're interested, but I would enjoy it. That there's one where you were had to take people out quietly, or you did take people out quietly. Do you remember that story? That you. <clears throat> Not just the same story. I don't know. Did, when you were taking those, moving those people, did you have to move them super, super quietly so that nobody would hear them move? Well, everything is at night. So you That's assume no one's going to make any noise. Right. <clears throat> you don't have to tell, you don't have to tell yeah. people. But some jerk will always do something, it's reveal it. Bring the heat down. And they had outposts along the ground too, so they were listening. So I'm glad you explained that because I would wonder how a nuisance would be put in front of an army. Like, well, they called it just a hard valley just for a good reason. Breaking rules, kind of guy. There's no way they'd put you up there <laughs> so for breaking rules. Like. Do we have? Do you want to? Can you tell that story of what qualified the Purple Heart thing? Oh, that's another episode. Oh. Didn't, didn't, um, uh, yeah, Juan's sister make a book of all this? Yeah. You know, in the middle of a fight, you know, they yeah, throw hand yeah. grenades and fire, and so I got clipped by one of the pieces, and, <clears throat> and I wrapped it up, and it got infected. So I, I didn't volunteer to go back. I had to wrapped it up, and I got it all infected, so they had to pull me off the line. Your phone is ringing. Yeah, let's forget it. <laughs> yeah, I heard it all day yesterday. And I did other things, which was basically against all the rules, but I was lucky I got away with it. Yeah. Luck plays such a role, like, there are no heroes, they're just lucky people. Yeah. We have to we have to bring in a new lieutenant came out of West Point and uh, was needed for the unit and so I walked down there of course to the got to go back to headquarters there which is a dugout <laughs> and get the guy and bring him along and I I took him along the same path I did twice only he went home. Uh, stepped on a certain spot and lost his leg. Oh, Jesus. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, luck plays a major role in all of, in all of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, you think you live a, a normal life, and then you realize just how fucking lucky you are that the 10,000 things that could have gone wrong didn't go wrong. Yeah. It's like, look at this, I'm still in one piece, actually. <clears throat> yeah. Jesus. See, when the Germans <laughs> made that <laughs> breakthrough, it caused all the problems. In uh, Belgium, the Vosges, uh, there was a twin attack. They were going in, uh, and on the uh, eastern side, there's right bordering Germany and France is Strasbourg, but below Strasbourg is what they call Silistat, or however you pronounce it. And uh, we held that town. Now, it's easy to hold a town in winter because otherwise you're in a foxhole in mud, you know? So there's its tendency if you get into a town, you're going to hold on to it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so they, the Germans pushed a, a monumental attack against us in the middle of a snowstorm. And they had all their tanks were painted and all everyone with white suits, you know. And so I spotted uh, one of those giant tanks for water, you know, way up in the air. And I said, I get my outpost there. Mm. So I got the unit and pulled them up there, went up there, climbed up there, and spotted. We were spotters at that point, right? And uh, within half an hour, the sun came out. The weather changed radically. Now, all of their camouflage worked against them. Like it was so, it was so, no, it was so precarious that our artillery had to use their artillery like rifles. They had to bring them down all the way to a level to fire them. Wow. <laughs> Not close, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so Ada, so uh, Hermann Goering and Adolf Hitler said, the Germans from this point have to fight for their positions the way the Americans fought for Celestat. Oh, my God. But... Uh, Became the archetype of... But anyhow, so I got back down, and uh, one of the uh, captains said, you know, you, you weren't assigned that. I said, well, it was, you know, it's the best place to take a look. He said, you know, one day you're going to get in goddamn trouble, Grimes. I said, I always get in trouble. So. <laughs> Getting in trouble, though, sounds like another coin for making a good choice that somebody didn't approve of. Yeah, that's you know, right. Like, I'm starting to see, like, for, for demonstrating intellect and for, you know, putting your mind to the situation in a way that's yeah. best for your... And I got busted, really busted, even though I didn't have any stripes. They took the leadership away from me. For that? Well... I was with a unit where there should be a lieutenant in charge of our seven-man unit, sergeant, six men. In the three years, I never saw him. Chicken he stayed shit. in headquarters. Chicken shit. So this time, I get the orders from the top sergeant, from this lieutenant, uh, who I never met, to occupy as an observation post this unit, a house on a slope. It was, you know, uh, bare ground, but trees all around us, a couple of a uh, hundred yards away. So I looked and I said, Jesus. See, that looks like a target to me. I mean, how are we going to get in the house? So I said, oh, well, okay, here it goes. So I got the guys. We 
got in there. <laughs> I get in there, and it's already occupied by a, a team with a heavy machine gun position. They never told us. So therefore we were spotted coming and they started throwing shells. Whoa! <clears throat> we exposed the position. <clears throat> so I said <clears throat> to the guys, we're getting out. Let them see us getting out and that'll save the position. The heavy machine gun. You can't pick up a heavy machine gun and run. You know, it's 30 caliber and it's a water-cooled, damn stupid World War One gun. So I did, and that stopped the artillery. So they said, you disobeyed a rule. I said, it was a fucking stupid rule. <laughs> you can't talk that way. You got to turn into your captain. And I said, yeah, well, okay. I'm here talking, aren't I? So they said, we're going to get, we're going to get someone in here who's a real sergeant. I said, well, I don't know. I've only been here for two years. I'd, I'd say. <laughs> so you were in North Africa, you were in Sicily, you were in Southern Italy, you were in Germany, you were in Belgium. <laughs> Somebody, I, I'm going to put together this story. I'm sorry. I'm going to go home and start typing right now. Oh, well. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, there are a bunch of things like that. So I didn't have a good I mean, military I remember career. about 20 stories I told, and I haven't written yeah. them down. And I will, and I'm going to do it. Yeah. Damn it. I have a copy of her book, but I, or really is a book, but I think it's being rewritten. Okay. But if you want to see it, I'll pass it yeah. your way. Thank you. Yeah. See, then I, then in all fairness, then I got another <clears throat> metal bronze star with an oak leaf cluster for something I never did. But the people in my unit <clears throat> uh, made it up because of a lot of other things they couldn't put down. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. <laughs> so I got this thing and it's not, it's, it's not true. But not you know, so I told. took it anyhow. So. Did, did you actually get a sergeant for your unit after? Never. Never. Oh yeah. Then at the end of the war, they, I did get some recognition. I was then posted as the <clears throat> uh, operation sergeant, which is next to a top sergeant, but they never gave me the stripes for that either. No, I make it up. Hmm. Yeah, I may. So I, I wasn't very, you know, obedient, but I got by. So how did you, how did you, how did you channel that into being a college student at a preppy university in Maryland? Oh, <laughs> that you must have held your mud so when long. I, just like when I got out of the <laughs> oh when God. I got out of the service, I decided, hey, you know what? Uh, going to school is better than not being working and not getting a job because I had no no background. <clears throat> so I said, you know, maybe I should get into. Uh, uh, TV yeah, okay. just started yeah. and the RCA had an institute where they were training people through their education to then get posts in the RCA industry for TV since they were so advanced they were beyond what was going on at the colleges but they had a preparation, they realized that a lot of GIs that were signing up for it were like me and didn't have the proper background to get in. So I took mathematics and physics and these kinds of things only. And uh, the instructor who I enjoyed, uh, he came up to me after the first semester and said, you know what, Pierre, he said, you'll never make it here. Uh, your kind of mind, it's not going to go for this. I said, you know, you're right. I mean, I passed all the tests. I said, you're right. Yeah, too much undercover, huh? So I had, uh, so I gained a bunch of academic, as it were, credit without going to school to pick it up, regular schools to pick it up. 
So then when I sent the letter to the St. John's, I just said, look, if you like other, if you like other colleges, forget it. And they said, come on down. That's how I got into UCI. I called them up. You're here. It's, it's not as noble as all that. I called up. I mean, Lucy picked up the phone and I said, well, I'm over here at Long Beach State and the place is bankrupt. There's no money. And so she said, well, come on over here. We'll give you some money. Yeah, so you. <laughs> so you. All right. <laughs> so the moral of my story is that having a bit of luck on your back pocket helps. Yeah. Yeah. Luck and seeing. I still remember that story you tell about leaving, leave, you know, going out beyond the line and coming back a different way. Oh, that That's was. That's a hair. Yeah, one. that was really. Woo! Yeah, that was. That's a luck story. Boy. That that played a major role, I think. Uh, yeah, at Anzio, my unit, <clears throat> we found a hole in the German units. They were, tra they were replacing troops, and they did it at this point in a stupid way and left a hole. And so that my, my. Battalion, right, which is a thousand men, uh, went all the way up. When the report got out that we found a hole in the German lines, the, the captain said, "Well, we're going to put in a whole platoon to sneak behind the German lines. I'll get okay from the major." The major said, "Bullshit! If you can get a platoon, and we're going to send a company in." Then it went for approval, and the. Some someone up, I don't know who it was, said, "Bullshit! If you can get a company in there, go at night, go at night, go quietly, get in, a, get in, but your whole, but get your battalion in there." Yeah. So, me and a bunch of other guys were the leader. We at night had to go up this mountain, and the rules were no bullets in the chamber of any gun. Right, everything is silent. You have to occupy this key position. And the next morning, we're looking down at the Germans and all of their fortifications. So they split us into two groups. One group going to face the Germans and shoot the hell out of them, and the other group preparing for a counterattack, which always hmm. takes place. Hmm. So. <laughs> Yeah, my unit. Sorry, I like the my unit was. We were there. I was on the outpost, looking to see where the hell the Germans are coming from. So, uh, uh, again, I didn't get approval, but uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to, to, to go on a patrol and go down behind the German lines and see what the hell is going on. So, so uh, I was carrying a, uh, carrying a Tommy gun at that time, and uh, now get this, all right, like, we're behind the German lines, and I'm going be going looking for them, right? And also, by the way, going to see whether we could get some water, <laughs> which we needed after this truck going up the mountain. Anyhow. Uh, ran into a German patrol who were scouting for the same reason. I'm like, there were you guys, and here, here's m me and two other guys, right? Whoa. So I figured here's time for, you know, let a couple of nice Germans go to hell, so I, doesn't work. <gasps> oh, man. And it turned out I was damn lucky because it wasn't a three-man patrol, it was a major patrol of Germans. Wow. So, uh, actually I pulled back, see, time to, you know, got a jammed Tommy gun and uh, worked my back way back, but I couldn't go back the same way I came in. It's like, you can't go on a night patrol without coming back the same way you went in. I mean, you, you, I couldn't do it because the German patrol was blocking us, so I had to come up another way. 
So I make my way back to the unit, <laughs> my unit, and a guy comes up to me and he says, I want to look at you. So he's looking at me in the face, see? And I'm figuring, what the hell is going on? He said, you know, I had you in my gun sights for at least five minutes. He said, I don't know why I didn't pull the trigger. You had no fucking business being there. At night, you're indistinguishable from any other German. Helmets are somewhat similar, you know? He said, I don't know. I got to take a look at you. Why, they, why didn't I pull the trigger? I said, thanks. Mm. You know, thanks. So that's luck. You know, all kinds of luck. Luck is essential. No. So, I, a matter of fact, I went on another patrol and uh, on my own with a couple of guys and uh, captured a couple of Germans and brought them back. And again, you know, the top sergeant said, you know, no one told you to get the hell out of there. You know, you, you, you just went on your own. I said, yeah, well, it was important to do something and that was... <laughs> Stay busy. There's a war. <laughs> <laughs> gotta fight it somehow. So I got a strange reputation in the unit. <laughs> but you know, there was only a couple of casualties in my unit for the whole war because mm -hmm. uh, when I was on outpost duty, I would always make sure that there was an exit for ev a way out of every place I ever took. You know, like yeah. only pick a good place for seeing if you can find a good way to get out. And that worked over and over again. Was that the remember where Remember the Alamo came from? <laughs> for so many years. For so many years you used to say in certain situations, Remember the Alamo! <laughs> no back drawer, you know. Yeah, well. <laughs> how, how old were you when you left? What? How old were you when the, the war? whole war? No, how old were you when it was over? Uh, two thousand and eighty. Uh, Here. Four years. What? <laughs> Here, that may. Eighteen. Eighteen. Here, that may be Nancy. She's. It's been about three or four times. So, so you. She was saying that that's probably Nancy. Yeah, okay, all right. So you got... Yeah, I got six missed calls. <laughs> so you got, you got to see... Um, what? You got to see well, kind of what you were made of very early in life. I wouldn't, I, I don't know whether, that's a good way of putting it, but yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. I think it's pretty amazing because some of the qualities that we appreciate you about our teacher are still present in what made you. Oh, wait a minute. War, I do right? have a, a good memory for you guys, which okay. I may have told. My father sent me a chess game, a little one, you know, and you could, so I, and he sent me a book on the golden treasury of chess. Mm. So I figured, hey, you know, I'll study chess. So now get this now, I'm in a Texas unit. Uh, you may not know what that means, but it's like you're in a company of Trumpians. Mm. Okay. okay. The flag of Trump. Salute the Trump. Sing the Trump song. A, a New Yorker, right? A New Yorker. I saw a picture of that unit. They were one of the scariest looking bunch of guys I've ever seen. Yeah. And he's in there with a the chess, with the chess board. These were serious guys. Yeah. Um, so, these guys are seeing me playing chess by myself. I'm just learning. But I figured, I'll try to master one of these games in the golden treasury of chess 
the whole book is only about the greatest games, the history of chess and the greatest games. Mm. So I picked this one and I went over it and over it and enjoyed the... <laughs> We're pulling back now. We're in Germany, We've just entered Germany and uh, getting resupplied and ammunition and that stuff. And the top sergeant comes in and he, he says, there's a goddamn crowd and he's beating everybody in checkers and chess. Go in there and I said, I'm just a new, I'm, hey, you got the wrong person. He said, anyone who can play chess by themselves is pretty advanced. I'm going, okay. So dig this, you know, everything is all sealed, all the windows are sealed, blackout, and there's any number of GIs are watching their buddies going down the tubes, right, losing, 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 and this German is smiling and his wife is marching around triumphantly. So I get on the board and I make a move and I say, oh, interesting, I make a move. Is an interesting? He's following the same game. The, the, the one game. He's the very same game. <laughs> and so <laughs> that you must have. I'm going very slow, see. So, um, <laughs> he's so good that like it's nine, ten, eleven moves, and it's the same thing, see. But I get to the point that I didn't understand. And so uh, I decide to risk it, and, and I don't know whether it's a good move anymore. See, it's been, so I'm ready to reach for the knight to move the knight, and his wife goes, ha ha. And I go, oh, it's a bishop <laughs> move. <laughs> he gives up. Whoa! Wow. He gives up. He says, oh my God. He says, brilliant move. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's play another. I said, no, no, I don't have time. <laughs> That's luck, right? That's luck. That's luck. No. That's like, no, no. no. But some, I don't agree with that. Somebody said that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Okay, that's good, but, uh, but yeah, providence. Uh, like, maybe it's luck that this. I gained a certain game. reputation. I was right, right, right. <laughs> uh -huh. just genius. In a Texas regiment, you have. I mean, there's probably parallels somewhere, but Tex Texas. Just sounds like the worst kind of football locker room. I could have. I should have shaken her hand and said thank you, dear, but I didn't. Yeah, see, that's the part that's not luck is the watching. <laughs> the the being present with your mind, <laughs> like. <laughs> did did she do it? Did she do it very loudly, or was it kind of quiet? Did his wife laugh loudly, or was it kind of? Quiet? Oh no! Oh no! Just a just a. <laughs> oh, okay. It, it was that's a tell. enough for me. Just enough. You know? <laughs> In poker, they call that a tell. A tell. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she and she's walking behind me. She's going, ha ha. And I went, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy quits. I wouldn't know how. To, I wouldn't have known how to end the game. Mm. Oh, that's that's cool. major. Interesting stuff here. Um, His paradigm was crushed. <laughs> Luck. And that led to Platonic philosophy somehow. <laughs> mm. Chapter two. Well, chapter eight actually. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Enough of that. Oh. I was interested that your dad, you described your dad as having derived a formula or improved upon a formula for sugar syrup that he could have made a lot of money on had his two partners not skunked him, so to oh. speak. And I remembered a story about Joseph, oh. who similarly was skunked. But I don't know if that was pathologos or just oh. act. Joseph did have this big idea and was really a brilliant idea and his two partners. As I understood it, he was keeping the, 
basically keeping the company afloat by using his credit cards, right? Yeah. And, um, but at some point, I don't know whether he, I don't know how that happened, but I remember that they, they completely X'd him out of it. You know, they managed to, so I was interested by that. That was fascinating. Well, that there was a pair of two. Yeah. Yeah. I love the prohibition. See, I taught Joseph how to play chess in terms of uh, what are the minimal number of moves that we can bring about a checkmate. Ah, that's good. And there are several so-called key games. <clears throat> hmm. If a player does this or that, then you can quickly win. And one is called the scholar's checkmate. And uh, I taught that to Joseph. He was about um, six or seven. Mm. And so he would then go with him when we were in New York. Then he'd take his chess set, see, and go to the local little store. And people would, oh, I'll play this kid. And he'd pull the sit and <laughs> the scholar's checkmate. <laughs> again and again, <laughs> he gained a great reputation <laughs> for playing chess. <laughs> and another is the 12 moves. And so he knew the key vulnerable poor moves that start chess openings that bring about their own defeat. Hmm. So. I just saw him last night. Uh, hmm. Last night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I came to Friday night. How's he going? How's it going with him? He's doing some interesting things. I was trying to figure out uh, see uh, for some reason, I'm taking an interest in uh, <clears throat> what is money and uh, what constitutes the strategy behind money, right? And uh, Joseph is into that to some degree. And so I wanted to know what he saw with the new crisis that's coming, and it turns out he didn't, he wasn't aware of it, but uh, September 30th, the big financial people behind IMF, International Monetary Fund, mm -hmm. fund are, going, are going to make a fundamental attack against the American dollar which, by the way, is what they did with Greece. The reason Greece went under the you know, went through terrible financial crisis because the IMF decided to teach Greece that they shouldn't do what they did with their state money. Yeah, that's what they do. So, in September 30th, they're coming out with a new kind of currency, an international monetary system that will attack the American dollar. See, the American dollar, everybody internationally uses as a system of, of mutual exchange, whatever you do. And so they're all, they are always charged a certain percentage by the international banking group, and that supports American uh, absurdities in politics and all over the place. So I want to know from Joseph, what are the implications of this new currency that's going to hit on September 30th? He didn't know about it, which shocked me. Uh, because in principle, it should, it means that they are going to, they are going to force by their own mutual agreements, pull out of the dollar dominance in the monetary system and replace it with this international currency. Instead of the euro, it's going to be earth bucks. Huh? It's going to be earth bucks. 
not the euro, but yeah, something that's right. global. Yeah, this is yeah, this is a global event. But they designed it because they couldn't get what they wanted from the euro. Okay. And which that, is a profit. Yeah. Enough profit. And uh, like there are several major thinkers involved in this who are predicting, uh, but the range of differences in terms of the implications of this are so wide that I wanted to ask Joseph, who's into that game, and he wasn't aware of the uh, oncoming threat. Mm -hmm. And uh, like the best advice is uh, Whatever, wherever you have dollars, uh, you're going to lose. Mm. Fortunately, they're going to lose their value because everyone is dumping them in order to exchange it for this new international currency. And whenever you dump a lot of things, no matter whether it's shares, tables, or money, it loses its competitive value compared to other currencies. Right? That's in principle. That's all it is. So. Uh, like some people think it's going to cost the dollar uh, maybe 20% of its value. But the extreme thinkers who I'm somewhat like to read about, they think it may be as much as 80%. So like it's a, it's a catastrophic possible financial move. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to talk to Joseph last night. I said, hey Joseph, what the hell is the story about this? So, uh, and of course, the implication of that on the on the finance on the coin, gold and silver, uh, that's going to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. mm. And they have good reason to suspect that uh, that gold will go from uh, thirteen hundred to five thousand an ounce within a short period of time. What, what do they see that America is not doing? That Pardon they, me? What is it that they're saying that America is not doing that they think this is what they need to do? What, to punish American dollars? I'm having a problem with my hearing today. That's okay. And they are not working the way they should. So, what did you say? I think, uh, were you referring to the... What is it? It, it didn't work with the euro? What? Why is it that the IMF is going to go to this currency? Is it to punish America, like they punished Greece? And what is it that we're? If that's the case, what is it that well, we're not? Well, hey, uh, put it in the other way. What do they gain? Oh, they gain. Uh, they gain a financial empire beyond beyond their present holdings. If you end up being able to control money, then you're moving the center of the financial empire from the United States to the Euros. And a small group of financial geniuses are pulling this stunt off. They're a breakaway group from the old IMF. And they can do that. Because I thought it was going to China, and that's where the yeah, well, that is what some people think, but I, I, uh, the uh, evidence is otherwise. <clears throat> yeah, China is, China is buying up all the gold they can. Of course. They have been doing that for years, so, uh, because they wanted the yen to be the international currency, and this is shortcutting it. So. What are they? What are they called today? Hmm? You said they came from the IMF. Yeah. What are they called today? What are they called? Yeah. Harry, Fred, and Joe. Harry, Fred, and Joe. I don't know. Oh, okay. There's just there's a group of all the, of the extremely rich and powerful people who pulled out of IMF and are doing this. Oh, I see. I mean, if you have enough money, you can do what you want. 
Who's the ones that are the like inventing new money? Yeah, yeah, well, money is a commodity. If they have as much as they they have, then they have the power appropriate to their income. You know, some of these people only talk about trillions. They don't talk about having millions, billions. They talk about having trillions. Right, like the Bahama Islands, the tax haven uh, is said to have, in one one count, twenty four trillion dollars. Like the total amount of money circulating in the United States, right? They call the velocity of money. It has to circulate at a certain rate, and uh, we only have. Two hundred and fifty billion dollars to float the United States. All the rest is credit cards. Wow! Oh, wow! Right. So, if this is attacking the American dollars, it, their income, get out of here. literally, is thousands of uh, uh, a thousand times more <laughs> than the total amount of money. Moving around the United States economy, wow. you know, like that's more money than you have, I believe. See how good I am at that? Good, yeah. There's a lot more money than I have. So, if any, if you want to know more about it, I can pass whatever I have on the web to you if you want to. Sure. I'd like to say, I'd like to think. Yeah, okay, okay. See, there's a whole, there's a whole history about the Vienna Circle uh, in the financial world. So you have to, you have to see what is the relationship between money and work. Hmm. If you don't see the relationship between money and work, you don't understand what, what money is. Okay, if we are going through a violent change in work, then you lose its necessary connection with money. <clears throat> what would be such a violent change? Technology. Most of the great jobs that carried American industrial power has been replaced because of technology. Robots, right? Uh, foreign cars, they can build a foreign car cheaper than we can by two, two, two or three times. Mm. But the factories themselves are automated. So the number of workers needed to produce the kind of stuff you need or you want is disproportional. Therefore, there's no relationship today between money and work. Right? So that's why I, I keep pushing to me, uh, a few people like me. <clears throat> I'm saying you have to redefine money, you have to redefine work. And that means the government has to make work, that's the WPA, like during the Depression. They have to create jobs to, to allow people to work to get the money. Mm -hmm. Or you have to do what Rome did, free bread. Mm. Like if we don't have slaves, we have automated machine machinery. That's the that replaces slaves or workers. Mm -hmm. Then you've lost the connection between work and money. But the people who put those kinds of advancements in workforce in place only did so to disenfranchise the workplace. The That's workers. right. So they're not going to be so willing to say, oh, now that we have robots, let's turn all that profit back to the people. That's it's right. already it, it was because the motive wasn't the right motive in the first place. That's right. So it's going to be 
dismantle the corporations, and that's going to tell them. I don't know who's going to do that. Bernie Sanders, I guess. Well, uh, she, the the. Uh, <coughs> See, in our time, Nixon passed a rule that allowed the dollar not to be connected with gold in any way. Roosevelt did that first. He separated the dollar from the gold backing it. When we were in the war, if you had a dollar bill, most dollar bills before 19, uh, 1930, see, there was a lot of dollar bills in place. If you had one which was common with a yellow stamp on it, it meant that was redeemable for gold. Wow. So when we were in Europe, a lot of GIs would end up with some cash, American cash. The word was do not spend any kind of money with a yellow stamp on it because that means the receiver is can translate it into gold. Our goal, so to speak. Right, it was that serious. Yeah. So when Nixon passed his ruling that it lost any connection with gold, he allowed corporate millions to become billionaires. Mm -hmm. So therefore, money only has a comparative value next to other currencies. It doesn't have any intrinsic value itself. The question is, why call that money? If the standard for value was gold or silver, mm -hmm. now you separate it from it, then what is it? It's only its value then is comparatively against other currencies. Speculators. See my two, my my two uh, nephews, the twins. They're billionaires. They work in the international world of finance. Well, they got a good college education and knew what to do with it. Yeah. And all, it's a game, it's a, literally, it's a game. If you understand, there's only one college in the United States, if you have any children or young people you know, if you want to get them to really get into knowing, there's only one university in the United States that prepares people for these kinds of financial, in-depth understanding of gold and money, and that's John Hopkins University. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's the only one. And they have an advanced institute at Johns Hopkins, which if you get in there, you have an entree into the, the, the most sig significant players in the international financial world. Why? Because none of their publications make any literal sense. Interesting. Right. The language they use is all coded. Okay. So it appears to make English grammatical sense has phrases that you can't relate to anything unless you know how to understand these critical phrases. And there's only one, one college in the United States that prepares its students for understanding money on this way, and that's Johns Hopkins University. The secret society is the society of money. The yeah. illiterati are the... Yeah. Are the people, people. people who go to that school, you know, the day after they graduate are millionaires. Yeah. Why? Because they know where to put a thousand dollars, it'll multiply into a million overnight. Wow. That's the game.
so so long as you have right so long as your economy is tied to people who can manipulate currency value and can as a result of that uh, control where money goes and at what rate it, it can be exchanged they have the power international they, they're really the rulers of the world And that's what has to see Bernie. Bernie Sanders is the only one in the politics who understands that. Mm. Like he's done his homework. He says, hey, it's the it's, it's financial system you have to attack. He's absolutely right. Elizabeth Warren, too. Elizabeth Warren, too. Yeah, and uh, like the Clintons, you know, they're one of the biggest uh, financial uh, philanthropists uh, like 90, 95, actually 94, 90, about 95 percent of their donations, which is in the millions, no, yeah, happens I mean, to go just to one firm. Would you like to know the name of the firm? Yeah, sure. I know the name. Saudi of Arabia? No. The, the Clinton, Clinton Foundation. Foundation. <laughs> yeah, a million dollars this year. That's right. <laughs> they put in millions of dollars into their own foundation to escape taxes as a donation, which then they can draw from for anything they want. <laughs> See, they went to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it'd be interesting to see what Trump's tax returns, because they just reported that I think it was 34% um, oh. tax, taxes that Clinton's paid for. I don't know. Anyhow, so. They did, but they also said 9% went into the foundation. Okay. Yeah. It? yeah. It was thirty-four percent they paid in taxes, but nine percent of the adjusted total. Well, they made ten million, and they put one million into uh, their foundation. So. That's great. That's not bad. I'd do the same. If you did that, what could you do? You take your money. You figure out how much you can legitimately give to a foundation or. Mm -hmm. Nonprofits, mm -hmm. and it happens to be your own foundation. <laughs> well, that's what um, <laughs> Bates does. You don't have a copy Hillary Clinton when just revealed tax her tax and records. Tax right, 30, yeah, but yeah. that's what Bates does. And that's what he shows. Where it is, that's um, the problem. That's what and Bill Gates does. I know it's, 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 yeah. it's another, he puts it's, it's money into his foundation, but then he gives it away. Rather than more than 100 boxes that aren't in my house. But so, he does it. Within, I will keep an eye out. Oh. Well, I need to I think I know where it is. I think I know where it is. Which is Monday. I have a five-day file. Monday. 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 Now financial people, the advisors, you can rank right, by the Grimes principle, which is a standard principle in what, the international world. It is the Grimes principle. Yeah, yeah. and the Grimes principle says <clears throat> you Primarily, you want to talk to and listen to the people who went to Johns Hopkins University and excelled in their advanced program of international money, because that means they know how to read all the international reports and know where the economy is really going. That guy has a special newsletter, which you have to pay to get to see, and if you pay to get it, then you, then you have an insight into what he, and then you can see how others think in comparison, mm -hmm. and you can make more interesting judgments. Mm -hmm. 
It cost seventeen hundred and fifty dollars to get that newsletter. That's a, wow. that's a valuable piece of information. A year? A month? Seventeen hundred and fifty dollars. A year. Wow. By the way, there's also a way you can get three months for five hundred dollars. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. More expensive but shorter term. Yeah, but hey, that will cover September thirtieth. Yeah. Ah. August. Right? September, October. July, yeah. August, September. So Who is this guy? That's what you need. Hmm. Do you know his name? Do you know his name? Yes. Right. I'll give it to you. I'll send it to you. Yeah, I Now, wait a minute. Yeah, For the three months, it's $500. Any five people want to play? Put in 100 Yeah, I'll play. Huh? I don't have 100 Because I'll send it in. But I can't afford 500 Yeah. Well, if we split it three right? ways, that gives us... 130, what's it? He's the, he's the genius who was able dollars. to predict every single economic downturn for the last 20 years That's in advance. And therefore, if you want to learn how to understand money and investment, see, with him, you have an inside, then you can compare the other people's reflections. Mm-hmm. That's why I say this is called the Grimes Principle of Economic Studies. Hmm. It might work. You want to risk it? I actually do because uh, I don't have any money to make money with, but I have incredible credit. And the credit I have could be used to right take now, pull some money out. To put invest, into gold. And put into gold. No, see, the, the, this is, that's, not, see, that's not true. See, there are two ways of putting money into gold. One is find a legitimate place like you know a shop in in Utah that's a reliable exchanger of money. Okay. Don't you? No, I know somebody here that is. I just pulled up an article. Right, right. right. Forbes. But you see, but see, what you want to find, see if, if you go with my logic. You can buy gold, find, you have to find someone who can sell it to you at the best rate. That's a big problem. All right, let's say that's solved. Say, um, what would it be like if you discovered that in Nevada, they have opened up a new gold find that has been kept quiet? Well, uh, and there are a small company that has a limited budget. You can buy their stock. Mm. Now, would you not agree you might want to see, in principle, what happens to that, these two possibilities over uh, one year? Mm. Yeah. The history of two gold mining companies, small in Nevada, in the last year, have escalated their value. This is a new one, and it's just new, see? Mm -hmm. And they've discovered a new way to to mine and extract the gold, a new process. Therefore, the production costs plummet. Would you be interested? Which which way would you go? I'd go with the startup. Yeah, Why? me too. I mean, I don't have a lot of money, but whatever I can do. Oh. Yeah, okay. I'll put mine in. You're all in. Okay. We need and so the rest people. of you. Whether you I can't, anyway. Now, one of the rules they have is don't tell your friends. I, uh, <laughs> I have no objection to telling friends by... That because I don't see that they have any particular ethic other than gold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So this guy, therefore, has made a study of gold and other things, but he's into that game. And uh, see, knowledge-wise, forget the, whether you make money or not, you'll get an insight into the way in which money is made, produced, controlled, manipulated, because that's, that's his game. He's going to tell you. What does he get out of it? $1,750 for so many thousand people. Mm -hmm. So he's selling his knowledge. Mm -hmm. Which, and if you want to know, that, like that kind of knowledge is not equal to, to philosophical knowledge. And there's a small group in Southern California that's involved, that can be involved in selling knowledge that will go beyond the value of, of gold. Yeah. That's so true. That's true. I'd rather do that. Put my money there. Right? Yeah. Maybe we ought to invest in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? But wisdom has no currency value. Yep. Some circles. Ah. So I, I want to just make sure I counted that correctly. I don't want yeah. to end up shortchanging you. Thank you. Oh, good, good, good. So and are we going to meet tomorrow for Parmenides? And if so, where? And I pulled out my own hundred dollars. Do you know? In the same bucket. There you, it is. Pierre, do you know a couple of other people that you can talk to about this, and so that we end up? moving on this or can I talk to somebody or uh, well you'll be able to I can talk to but do you know p other people that you might mention this to that have a little extra cash I just thought of it this just this morning okay I, I wish I did well, uh, let me know what you come up with and I'll and I'll look around I know a couple of yeah, people yeah I'll lose out on the yeah boom. well yeah. see this is re this is research and development here yeah. and it costs money yeah. it see very few people know about this big financial uh, boom that's going to hit on September 30th. To me, it's vital that the people we know mm -hmm. can anticipate in some way, and because it's going to be a, a shock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, what, is the, what does that do to this, that, and the other thing? I do not know. <laughs> What will this do to property values? What will this do to income? What will it, you know, if the dollar is going to lose its value? What are the implications of it? Yeah, maybe I don't. Have Someone to has to know that, <laughs> and that's what I tried to get from Joseph. I said, "What are the implications of this, Joseph?" He said, "Holy shit!" He said, "I, I don't even know about it." Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's his business to, to you know, he's into that world, so. He said, you have to send me, right? You have to send me the name of that guy and, and, and et cetera. Get him, to buy, get him to buy in on this investment. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll do the rest. You'll find a couple of people too. Yeah, yeah. But I think it would be worthwhile if you know anyone who might be interested when we get the information, see, to have a closed meeting. Yeah. Here, or at Gina's or David's or something, and yeah. lay out some facts. <laughs> I mean, like one of the one of the one of the guys is saying that the inevitable consequences is that gold's going to go to fifteen thousand dollars for one ounce. Wow! Ouch! That's huge. That's huge. I'm going to go buy 10 ounces tomorrow. Right. So another guy said only 20 percent. Uh, that's still huge. But that translates not just in 20 percent more value. <laughs> There's. <laughs> See, because the shock when this hits, people are going to look for places to save whatever they've got, and that's going to raise the value of everything. Right, of silver and gold. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
I didn't have anything planned for tomorrow. These two gold companies that this guy identified, and I knew it, by the way, uh, more than a year ago, uh, its value increased 1,800%. Wow. Those are, that's a good investment. No. Oh. Well. The gold companies, these two that he identified previously. And that's like you have to learn how to think in new terms. Yep, I, I, I run this, this, this. I've been running this scam for years. Um, you know, just getting more and more money from the bank and more and more money from the bank, and and um, I'm still alive, and that's what I'm going to continue doing. I think I'm just going to borrow some money and because. I don't have to pay back my loan for 10 years. The chances that so, I would even be alive in 10 years. See, it's a risk. Like right now, if let us assume this is true, all right? Would it be worth going and borrowing 10,000 and putting it out? Yes. <laughs> Wherever or whatever you have that you can get together to do something with. Where's the narrow? Now, uh, uh, maybe a year ago, I'm not sure, uh, I identified one of these gold companies and uh, got in touch with Julie, Gra Julie Hargarb, uh, pardon me, Julie Grable, like rushes into the game of finances and buying and selling. And I told him, I said, this is the this is the stock to watch. This is going to boom. So he did some homework and he said, yeah, we'll put some money on it right now. Do I know what has happened to it? No. Will I give them a, a letter and uh, email and find out what happened? Let you know. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I heard a follow up on that. For a yeah. while, she was really nervous. But apparently now she can do whatever she wants, so that should tell you something. Yeah. Ju uh, 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 Julie Grable, yeah. Julie, Julie Polsta. For a while she was really nervous about it, and then all of a sudden she was like, "Now I can do whatever I want." It may be because of this chip. Yeah. You see, I told her this is the kind of company that's going to break through. He did some research on it, and he put some money in it. But that's over a year ago, and I don't know what happened. So I'll drop him a note and say, "What the hell happened?" Yeah, to we're in it. Yeah, and I, I get that money morning thing. I'll start reading those and see what I can find out. Mm hmm. I, I haven't for a while. Well, you can drop her a note and say we had a discussion, and Pierre was interested in knowing what happened to the stock he recommended. Okay. You can. I can. All right. I have to find an avenue for that. Yeah. See, because. All other kinds of stock may plummet in this exchange, but these people, the key people, know invariably fortunes can be made in every depression, mm -hmm. if you know where to put your money. And what kind of money is money? So, it may be worth passing the information and see what you do with it. Absolutely. Right? All right. Well, tomorrow we have a question. No. I, I'm not capable of, for a while, I won't be able to host. No. Probably through September. No. no. Sorry. No. Fine. And I don't know where the, the talks are going, but in the meantime, tomorrow we need to no. come up with a place. No. Here? No. Is here okay, Gina? No. Well, we're leaving for uh, Arizona on, on Sunday. That's tomorrow. 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 Yeah, that's why I'll be there on Monday. Yeah. You can tell by the way he said it. That this is true sarcasm. Oh, right. Trump you. says he's sarcastic. Ah! No, this is true sarcasm. This is true sarcasm, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> but that was the plan, Mon Sunday, really? Funny. I have heard that... Sunday, but I heard this morning that there's a quiver in her voice, mm -hmm. and I say, 
Well, I won't get ready tomorrow. And this is two sick children with Aaliyah, right? Mm -hmm. If they're still sick, two young children, sick. Aaliyah's gonna uh, take Nancy. <sighs> That means you're yeah. going to be here for a couple of days. Well, I got a lot of work I have to do that I want to finish in Arizona. All right. You've got these huge butterflies coming in. Mm. Yeah, well, oh, in Arizona. Yeah. Well, because I gave uh, Aaliyah my house. Yes. Oh, it's done? She's got because it? They're broken. They have two beautiful children. I'm not going to watch them go down the tubes. Mm -hmm. So until they get on their feet, we move around. And, uh, but, See, years ago I got into this financial game and then quit. But there's a whole history of the origin of money and the role of the banking in Venice. Like, where did the financial empires begin? Like, that's really a very interesting study. And years ago I got into the idea of social credit. <clears throat> which Canada adopted for some years before they, they took it out, which is uh, a new way of looking at money. And I enjoyed it. And it was called social credit. Hmm. They only passed one law to gain taxes from the public. What was the law? One. And the principle was, they will only tax things that are not in production. What does that mean? Money in banks. That people who pull things off the marketplace to create a scarcity, to that degree, have to be taxed. Great. Right. Anybody, therefore, who, who keeps in reserve anything and is not allowing it to flow into the general economic world, that's taxable. No taxes for people who work. Never tax people who work. Tax people who are not using what they have to make money on not doing work. Is that, isn't that, uh, isn't that Henry George's That's Henry George. Philosophy? Henry George's, uh, Henry George is the greatest uh, economist out of San Francisco during the middle of the 19th century. He wrote a magnificent book called Progress and Poverty. He said the two are inevitable. Mm. With progress there is poverty. He shows it. That's what you want to read, right? Right? Mm -hmm. That's the myth of progress. That it's going to disenfranchise and to understand more, that. Dis disenfranchise more and more people. See, as progress goes on, everything that is not in, in, in currency gains its value. If I and, and we bought some property in Costa Mesa when we first got here and did nothing with it, what would its value be today? About uh, eight times, eight to ten times, depending. Right. That's taxable. Okay. That difference. Wow. If we do nothing with it. Right. So, 
big dealers do that all the time. Like the people that want to have a bullet train going from LA to San Francisco. They don't care about that. They want the map where that route is going mm. and where the stops are and they're buying up all the properties in those areas. Okay. What will that do? Well, it will track up the price of the bullet train tremendously and the put a lot of dough in their pockets. <laughs> By doing that, they're not working, right? You're they're right. signing pieces of paper. That's right. And what happens to the value of the property? Way up. Mm. Yeah. And that's what they that's what they're doing. Thought of that. If you See, the whole, on this level, the people that have the power know how to manage money for their own profit and how to move it around to benefit some countries and not others. That's what happened in Venezuela. That's what happened in Chile. Right? Etc. Mm -hmm. They didn't have problems before this. Why do they hit against Greece? They want to suspend the payments to the ex-civil service workers who are no longer working or retired because their pensions were so high in their eyes that they wanted to undercut the currency of Greece and force them, therefore, into bankruptcy so they couldn't pay the workers. Well, there's, there's another problem with Greece, and this is, this is a, you, you should know this for the future reference. It's considered a sin in Greece to pay your public taxes. Nobody in Greece pays taxes on anything. And so income tax and the kind of tax that keeps the government going, these, you did not pay them. You do not pay them. And all that money goes into investments in Central Europe and Northern Europe and in all these fine places, properties and, and you know, there are whole towns in, in, in Swiss Alps that are unoccupied because every house is owned by a Greek who vacations there two, year, two, two weeks a year. And so they're, they're now saying you cannot have a municipality if it's less than 30% occupied at all times. That's how bad it is. Yeah. So in Greece, one of the things about the Greece is they pay, they retire at 56, they get a great pension, and the government pays their pension, but nobody pays taxes. The Greeks are the laziest but people see, in the world. According to this principle, you, you, should should not, you should not tax workers. Okay. It's not that they don't pay taxes, right. they shouldn't pay taxes. Okay. That's, that's, that's opposite, yeah. Right, because mm -hmm. there are some people who are making such incredible fortunes that yeah. it's minuscule in terms of what they can gain from the workers' taxes. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, the question again is, what is money? Where does it go? It's just, th those are the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, it, 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 I see it as tenuous at best, even if it stayed the way it is. I would feel tenuous because I don't have an income other than what the government's going to pay me. And who knows where that's going to go in this equation. I don't know where that's going to settle out. But I see, you know, there's so many grand cities in this world that are surrounded by poor people. Like Mexico City, this much is poor, this much, you know, and the moment it collapses, that's all going to just implode on itself. And Rio and every major third world city is surrounded by this massive amount of poor people that that aren't benefiting other than by going through the garbage. No. I just see it as a huge social problem and I see it happening very soon. No. Are you aware of the principle of the velocity of money? No. Okay. What is money? See now, unless you have a clear image of what it is, then you have to add the idea of velocity to it to understand money. Is that how quick you get to the bank if you think you're in trouble? Right. <laughs> think of money 
as a stream with many, many tributaries. Okay. Along that stream is a source of commerce, fishing, ways of life, communities gather around the various tributaries and are supported by the water system. By the way, uh, what would happen if 10 people were to draw from that stream their own private reservoirs? Hmm. Trickle down is much less. Now, it the velocity true. of money, see? Money flows down the stream. It has to go at a certain rate so that it nurtures all the lands. Sure. If the velocity of money diminishes because it no longer has that ongoing pouring, you have what? Um, it's like a body with cholesterol. Everything, drought. Sto everything, everything drops. Stops. Drought. stops. Everything dries up. So, like the total amount of money that circulates in the United States, money, is two hundred and fifty billion. All right, so what? Uh, everybody is on credit cards. The amount of money on credit cards is about 10 times the value of the 250 billion that's circulating on the stream. Wow. What happens if someone says, I want my money from the credit, all the credit payments? Uh, there's no, it's not there. It's not there. You're going to diminish the the flow of the quantity and the velocity of money mm. because people are going to suddenly have to pull out of that 250 billion to pay off the credit cards. And what does that do to the flow of money? Diminish more in the reservoirs at even a greater rate than these people with their private reservoirs. So if they are attacking, if they want whole, if, if someone wants their payment vis-a-vis -vis all the credit cards, what will that do to money? Oh. It'll dry it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Now, where do all the credit card? Where does all? Who owns all that credit? Some Chase Bank. The banks. The bigger banks, not the local banks. Yeah. Credit Suisse, Chase Bank, UCF, UCF. And by the way, they're interested in gaining money to play. They're going to draw it away from that so they can play their own financial games at the cost of the local economy. That's it. So one of the threats, you see, on the 9-11, uh, I mean 9-30, September the 30th, is in principle that they, are, they may be calling for cash on the cumulative credit card billions that we all owe but can't pay off. Right, we can do it over time, but if they demand, if somehow there's a demand for it, the whole thing collapses. That's the weapon behind how to undermine different countries' way of life and culture. And they're picking on the United States. Yeah, why not? And they're, and they're hey, among them are Americans with billionaires and trillionaires. They're not just Europeans. Mm -hmm. They form a group, a cabal. Is nothing sacred? I thought we were Americans. I thought you couldn't touch us. No, no. Hey, when America in the last, within the last year made the ruling that people, Americans living in foreign countries, still had to pay local taxes, mm. many of these so-called Americans turned in their, their American citizenship. Wow. Okay. Because they said, 
hey, uh, my whole way of life is gone if I have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. So they dumped it. But they don't know that wherever they're getting their money, they better be in a safe place for this exchange or they'll be without both. <laughs> Well, yeah. Now here's the problem. We could have spent our time talking about the difference between the idea of the good, the good, the soul, and the self. And whether or not there is the soul. Last night I wanted to ask this one question of our friend Alex, who kind of walked out in a huff. Does the soul have a self? Thank you. That's the issue. That was the question that needed to be asked. I mean, can you turn his problem about the difference between the self and the soul back See, on itself and allow the self to, to, to no, okay. flower? See, I would prefer an answer to that question to come out of the text. Hmm. Or we will have okay. to improvise or interpret, and I don't like that. So that really depends upon how you read the, the Phaedo. Hmm. See, what happens to the soul when it is separated from the body? Hmm. Does it encounter the pure, pure soul? What does it encounter? And in any way, is that related to the self? Mm -hmm. You know what? It's hidden in the text. Hmm. And the Roush and the Jowett and the Thomas Taylor. It's there, but it takes such careful reading that you need the Balboa's translation and we need to look at that. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do that next time we meet? Pull out 8081 in the Phaedo, the Balboa's translation, and let's look at that. Remember, you need the description of the separation of the soul from the body. He does not tell you what happens to it after that separation at 68, 69, right? It's only later in the text at 80, 81 that he describes the dynamics of what takes place and what is encountered. And if you don't have a clear idea of that, You're going to be confused about this, or you'll have to interpret, and I'd rather not do that. Mm. Cool. Next time we meet means here? Yeah, tomorrow? Tomorrow? I'm up for tomorrow? It. Sounds, it sounds easy. I think I can do that. Yeah, okay, so take a look at that key section. Okay. And by the way, the Rouse. You might infer it from the Roush, but then you're doing some very, very careful reading. Most people don't have the talent or the interest. One of us might have a lobe with the Greek. Right. I have a lobe. Right, right. Then you can... How about the, the Taylor? Hmm? How about the Taylor? Thomas Taylor doesn't touch it. Hmm. I yeah. wonder if I have the Phaedo. You could shoot... Juan on email, he might send you the Phaedo. I think it might, I might have it. You might have it? I yeah, he it. has a translation of the, the Phaedo. Yeah, well, I was saying... I'll, I'll was, contact him if I don't. Me too. Oh. But it's better to have the left-hand side mm -hmm. of the lobe. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, fun. Pierre. Thanks for sharing all that cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. That was fun. Thanks. See, we have to, have to take the stuff and not use it as a study, but to transform it into your own understanding. Otherwise you have an incomplete picture, and you don't want that. Yep. Hmm. I'm up for it. Yeah. Okay. Like the problem, can you have an image of the self? Good question. Well, they, they, in common parlance, the many speaks of a self-image, but whether that's accurate or not, the questions that was were being pursued last night, I don't know about that. Because you were talking, we were talking about the pure self, the self, 
and whether one could approach it through likeness or not. And approaching it through likeness would be an image of the self if there was a likeness. Yeah. But if the pure self is pure of everything, there can't be a likeness. See, it may, and it may be foolish to talk about the pure self mm. or the ideal self. It may be foolish. Because? Because that's, that's adding uh, balls to a snake. The, the word pure, you mean. Mm. Is, it, is it because saying it's ideal implies that there is a version that isn't ideal? Well, that there are what are you adding when you say ideal? You're separating it off from others. anything else. Yeah, from others. That's right. You're others. caught in a one-many problem. Yep. And the question is, can that be attributed to the self? No. No. Not what I understand. Not as you understand it from the first hypothesis. Nope. Nope. Or. You might have to look at the ending of the first hypothesis yeah. to take a look at what he does conclude to come to the idea that the use of the word self in itself is incomplete unless you stick one in front of it. Hmm. One self. I'll have to take a look. I think I remember that. But I thought it shot it forward in, I thought we talked about that as putting it forward into the second hypothesis. For okay, reason. so, I don't see? remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've never said that before. So, what you, we take one literally as the first hypothesis, mm -hmm. that self, or whether it's one self identifiable, then it's in the second hypothesis? If it is one self, I think it throws it forward. But I don't, I'd have to look at it. I don't yeah, remember that's the right, see? You made. Yeah. And if you want, yeah. see whether you can relate it to the oxygen pictures. Yeah. Well, you're better at that than Right? Most. That's another. Anybody I know. Yeah. And the question for that is what the hell is the ninth doing? Hmm. The ninth oxygen picture. What is this? Not much going on. No, not much going on. Uh, Why didn't you go. Eight, eight to ten? ten? What the hell is the ninth doing on there? Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Excuse the war experience bullshit. No, we all. I think we but, like uh, the three-partite dis division. <laughs> Although the sometimes things no. drag on me a bit. But. Uh, Ooh. My own theory is that. Uh, when anyone pins a medal on anyone, they should put across it, luck, ah. the mother of something. Mm. Survival. Or like, what is it? Mm. It's a very interesting question, luck. I think that's what Michael Phelps is And I know how to get an answer yeah. to that. He's been saying he's lucky? I thought, man, coming back after the absence he had from yeah. Olympics, wow. Michael Phelps, I think. I'm going to look at it. But, yeah. How? Oh. Ask someone who has the riddle. By the way, uh, where do you come from? Bosnia. Where? Bosnia. Where is that? S Southern Europe. Is, is that further away than Brooklyn? Yeah. Oh. Well, how did you get here? Luck. Huh. <laughs> Luck. More so than most. <laughs> Was it worth it? Actually, now that you mention it, luck has been a major part of my life. <laughs> me too. Did a bunch yeah. of things have to come together for you to be here? Oh yeah. So many things. All the things that I know of. Right? Yeah. Yep. It's what the hell is luck, see? Is that the errant cause in the Timaeus or not? It's a big mm. question. Worthwhile. Mm. Mm. I think it has something to do with providence. Ah, whatever the hell. Yeah, it gives you another one on top of the one I gave him. He gives me another one. <laughs>
be lucky because Providence wants it that way. <laughs> okay, nice people. Thank you, Pierre. Okay. Let's go. Luck. Luck. Thank you. Luck. 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 What can I do here? Um, Where'd you come from? Utah. <laughs> Where is that? It's in the middle of the United States. Oh. What kinds of things have to come together to get you here? Um, unlucky things, I think, actually. <laughs> But I've had a sh my share of luck since being here. Oh, luck again? Luck, yeah. What the hell is it? It's a safety net, I would say. South Central LA. Yeah. How did I get here from South Central LA? Thank you. I don't know. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. Thank oh, you. wow. Yeah. And I, I would have been, but for one it? single fact, I would have been back on the East Coast, but never gone, never seen here. Yeah. Luck. luck. Be lucky. That's how, whenever I go to the Who concert, right. that's what he says at the end. And, and, and thank you, that's everybody, right. and right. don't forget right. to be lucky. He says that every time. So I got to do some jokes. Funny guy. I, looked at a con I watched the whole concert the other night. Uh, just Pete Townsend.